we bought this what was at the time rather dilapidated bungalow a couple of years ago and our aim was to completely gut it, remodel it um, and very importantly improve the energy performance, bring it up to um, as high a standard really as we could afford to. The performance standard we chose to go for was the Enerfit standard. So the Enerfit standard is a standard developed by the Passive House Institute, but it's aimed more at refurbishment projects, recognising the difficulty of making a, um, a 1950s bungalow as energy efficient as you could starting from scratch. We did think actually about starting from scratch um, it probably would have been more economic to just knock the place down and start again. But when you're embarking on a, an eco project, it just doesn't feel right to start off by knocking down a, a perfectly um, sound, well-built house. And it's not the answer to the energy problems that the, the country faces. We can't just go and knock every house down and rebuild it. So we, we chose to try and make this as energy efficient as we could. Uh, building regulations in this country, you'd be looking at keeping your heat losses or the amount of heat you need to put into a building to about 150, 140, 150 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year. The passive house standard is 15 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year, so a tenth of that. And the Enerfit standard is 25, so much closer to passive house than... than um, than building regs. We did all the modelling, we optimised the types of insulation, and we went for a solution where the whole outside of the building is wrapped in insulation and made as airtight as we can. In fact, we have had the house tested since it was all refurbished, and, and we are somewhere between passive house and airfit. So while all that design work was going on, we then started thinking about heating systems. And I think it's probably true to say that the people that we were working with um, just assumed that we would go for a wet air source heat pump based system. Um, we had though, early on in the project, gone to an exhibition and seen infrared heaters being, uh, being promoted. We were interested. Um, and decided to try and do some comparisons with using heat pumps. Now we had enough space here to do a ground source heat pump, but when we started looking at the cost, it was just eye-watering. Um, even an air source heat pump, because we'd had to take um, all the original heating system out of the house, it was all furred up. Some of the radiators didn't have any heat going to them at all, it was in a terrible state. So it all had to come out. Um, the first obstacle was really if we'd gone for an air source heat pump, we would have wanted to put underfloor heating in. But the biggest challenge we've had with this house has been the floors. They're all solid floors throughout. Um, it's not really practical to get um, sufficient insulation into them to make um, underfloor heating a practical proposition. So we ruled out underfloor heating, which made us a bit twitchy about um, having an air source heat pump. Because this is an open plan living space, we haven't got a lot of free wall area to put radiators on. So as I say, we, we really did start thinking quite carefully about comparing um, air source heat pumps with infrared panels. And the big realisation that we came to was that for the price, for what it would cost to put a, an air source heat pump in, a complete wet system, we could have infrared panels plus a complete solar panel and battery system. As it's turned out, the solar panel and battery system plus the, the infrared panels are, are probably a little bit more expensive than, than an air source heat pump, but it's not, not wildly different. One of the frustrations about producing a very well insulated home is that if you put a, something like an air source heat pump in, you're spending a lot of money on something that hopefully you're not going to be using very much. Whereas by putting 
most of the money into solar panels and batteries, they're bringing benefit every day of the year, right the way through the summer and the winter. The heat loss calculations that we'd done helped us to work out how many infrared panels we would need and it also calculated or estimated how much heat we would need to put into the building. And we've sized the solar panels and batteries to, as close as we can, balance our production with, the, uh, the, our, with our usage. In the winter, when we need more electricity, um, we obviously don't produce as much of it. Now the batteries help a lot with that. So we're on an octopus flux tariff. That means that we can charge the batteries up overnight that at a, at a rate, a, a cost per, per kilowatt hour, that's about the same as we get paid for any energy that we export back into the grid. So at this time of year, probably three quarters of our energy is coming from the grid at night on a nighttime tariff, charging up the batteries. We top the batteries up during the day from solar. The solar, um, even now in January, is producing about a quarter to a third of our electricity needs and the other three quarters is coming from the grid, but on a nighttime tariff. And we've got enough battery storage to last us right through the day. So we're not drawing from the grid during the day at all, even though we've got um, infrared panels running, mostly in the mornings and the evenings. And our experience so far is that the, um, the amount of energy that we're getting from the solar panels is about what we estimated. The amount of energy that we're using is quite a bit less than we estimated. Now we've, we're, we're in a cold spell at the moment, but it has been a quite a mild autumn. We've only been in the house for three or four months, so we need to collect a lot more information yet, but the signs so far are, are pretty good. Um, and, and of course, by having infrared panels, um, we've got no maintenance costs. We've got a much greater degree of control over them. We can turn individual panels on and off whenever we want. We haven't got a whole uh, heating system to heat up. Um, we haven't got all the issues associated with wet heating systems. Um, and so the ongoing running costs not just the energy costs, but the maintenance and the, the upkeep costs are also going to be much lower. Um, and it's a very comfortable heat. We, before we made the final decision, and we were actually living in the building before it was refurbished, we decided to buy a couple of panels and just set them up and try them out, just experience the type of heat that you get from a panel, because it is very, it is very different, the, the, the experience of using infrared panels and we just found it's, it's, it's a very comfortable environment. I think it's very easy to get tied up in the numbers when you, you've tried to design these systems um, and it's a bit like the, within the house here also to get to the Enerfit standard we have a whole house ventilation and heat recovery system and that produces a very comfortable environment. It's not something people talk about quite so much. They talk about it simply as being a way of minimizing heat loss through, through ventilation. But that comfort that you experience is also important. And it's the same with, with um, infrared heaters. It's a very comfortable heat. It's a, it, it's a pleasant heat. You, you're aware of the heat coming from the panels. Um, and as a result, we're able to run the thermostats a degree or two lower than we would, um, for example, before we did the refurbishment and we had a, a gas-fired central heating boiler. We're now running the, the, um, the thermostats lower than we did before just because of the, the quality of the heat that you get from the panels. So, so far we're, we're, we're very pleased with them and some of the panels, to be honest, ha haven't been turned on yet in rooms that, um, that we don't use very much. Um, the level of insulation that we've got in the house is a big factor in that. Um, 
But we're expecting that um, because we've been able to put a lot more money into solar and PV, our energy costs across the year are going to be pretty much zero. And um, we hope that gets us well set up for the future. So it, it's, it's still quite early days. We, um, like many people who are interested in technology, and I've realised many people who buy solar panels and so on. Um, I've yet to come across somebody who's got solar panels and doesn't have a spreadsheet of some sort monitoring their, their production. We're interested in how these things perform and we're in, certainly interested in seeing how long term the reality of using these panels, the amount of energy that they consume and that sort of thing how that compares with, um, with the modelling that we've done. And, uh, and so we're collecting data to help us understand that. I think we really want to, in the future, exploit as much as we can that great controllability that you've got from being able to switch on and off each individual panel almost, C certainly by, by room. We've got thermostats all over the place. There is a feeling of, of um, yeah, that we're doing our bit to try and minimise our energy consumption. We can't, we can't go on burning gas and, uh, and wasting electricity the way most houses do um, for long into the future. And this is one way of trying to make a house um, carbon neutral or as close as we can get to carbon neutral without completely busting the bank and I think we're, we're not far off doing that.